Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Winter Book Club Picks. I'm Susan McGuire, Senior Editor, Collection Management and Library Outreach at Booklist. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. Links to today's slide presentation and title list were included in the reminder email you received from Zoom one hour ago. To download them, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the links located there. You can also download the slides and title list by copying the URLs on this screen into your web browser. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have any questions or need technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions and we'll pass along all other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Last but not least, Booklist offers closed captioning on all webinars. To enable or disable captions on your screen, please look for and click the live transcript icon on the toolbar mentioned above. From there, you can select show or hide subtitles from the menu that appears. If you choose to enable subtitles, you can adjust the size of the captions at any time by selecting subtitle settings. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from Let's see the next slide and then we'll find out. Ha -ha. Jane, Kirkpatrick, Jane Kirkpatrick, author of The Healing of Natalie Curtis from Ravel. Joanna Davis Politano, author of A Midnight Dance from Ravel. Sydney Check, marketing coordinator at Penguin Random House Library Marketing. Lainey Mays, marketing associate at HarperCollins Publishers. And Emily Ludloff, library marketing associate at Sourcebooks. First, we're going to hear from Jane Kirkpatrick. Jane, I'm having trouble with your name. First, we'll hear from Jane Kirkpatrick. Jane is the New York Times and CBA best-selling and award-winning author of 40 books, including Something Worth Doing, One More River to Cross, Everything She Didn't Say, All Together in One Place, and A Sweetness to the Soul, which won the prestigious Wrangler Award from the Western Heritage Center. Her works have won the Willa Literary Award, the Carroll Award for Historical Fiction, and the 2016 Will Rogers Gold Medallion Award. Jane divides her time between Central Oregon and California with her husband, Jerry, and Cavalier King Charles Daniel Caesar. Learn more at jkbooks.com, but for now, take it away, Jane. Thank you very much. And thank you all for joining me this morning and letting me talk with you about the healing of Natalie Curtis. As if you're not familiar with me, I write novels based on the lives of real people. I've never included them in the title before, but this is a story of a child musical prodigy who just before her New York Times Philharmonic debut in 1897 has a mental collapse. And uh, for five years, she's in a malaise until her brother who had been a librarian at the New York City Library, but had gone West a couple of years before that, invites her to join him in the West. And in she's, as she's preparing for that, she learns about the Code of Offenses, which was a US government um, law that prohibited Native people from speaking their language, singing their songs, and performing any of their um, ceremonies. While they're traveling around for her to sort of become acquainted with the landscape, in Yuma, Arizona, she hears this very haunting song from a human woman and knows that the woman is breaking the law to sing it. And she's so taken by this music that she makes a decision to devote the rest of her life to trying to preserve native music and stories and culture. And she uses her influence with uh, the then president of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt, to get her permission to take her little Edison recording machine and she and her brother on horseback and in wagons, drove around until she had what she needed. And the book was published in 1907 called The Indian's Book. Um, the next slide. 
please. Um, so this is a, most of my um, work um, will have themes. This one has a theme of healing and the importance of music in healing, but also other kind of cultural experiences. The pottery is an Akama pot. And it sort of is a metaphor in the story for resilience. Uh, the Akama pots were always very strong, but they were pretty fragile. And, and they would take the shards and return them when they were broken to the desert. And one um, old grandma at one point gathered up those shards and pounded them back into a powder and mixed them then with um, the new clay. And what they found then is that those pots were both very strong and, and also very beautiful. So I spent 17 years of my life working on the Warm Springs Indian Reservation here in Oregon. And many of the stories um, that I learned of were also stories that Natalie included in her book. I know that a lot of book groups like to do additional research and um, there, there is quite a bit of source material for uh, Natalie Curtis and the photographs are pictures that you would find on the internet. Um, often the women I write about don't have a lot of source material. My first, one of my first uh, book groups was by satellite phone. It was before there were cell phones. And it was in Belgium with the wives of the NATO um, officers. So I've been around with book groups and I love spending time with them. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. So this slide I, I included because I took that picture of the of the uh, Roadrunner. And I wanted to just mention one of the things about the power of, I think, the singularity of women's stories. Virginia Woolf said women's history must be invented, both uncovered and made up. And what you'll find in my stories is hopefully you can trust the, the landscape, the relationships, um, and the um, spirituality, which I, def I describe as how people gained their strength, where did they draw their strength from, and the work that they did, that I find those four elements really mix um, in most of my stories, but particularly about women. Um, there's no sex in my books, I'm, I'm sad to say for some of you, um, but the reason for that is not that I'm a prude, but because I made an agreement with my characters years ago that I would not reveal any of their personal sexual idiosyncrasies, and then they agreed not to reveal any of mine. Next slide, please. So I included this publisher's weekly um, really positive review in part for the, the notation that it's a portrayal of Natalie's fight for equality and cultural preservation. And that seems really timely for our time with um, issues of the discovery of um, graves at boarding schools of native, um, where native children attended and also that we have in the United States the first um, Native American Secretary of the Interior, a woman. And so <clears throat> I think that's um, critical. And then uh, the next slide. Uh, and that's that I wanted to include the book list review because it really captures the, the essence of things that I think would resonate with readers and that it's uh, looking at our own motives and choices and sometimes the unintended consequence of the help that we give. Um, this is a really a story about one woman's hope and purpose. Um, and yet it opens the door to talk about intellectual property, um, the ability to appropriate or not appropriate stories. And even my own as a writer, and as someone who um, spent time with Native Americans, how have I appropriated or have I appropriated? One of the things Natalie did do, and I think she understood intellectual property, is that every artwork that she included, every story, every song that she wrote down, she identified as the person who had given that to her. And I think that that indicates her great love for these people and the work that she did. But I think it's also a great um, starting point for a good discussion for a book group. So thank you all very much for letting me be a part of this this morning. And I hope you'll enjoy the, the literary music of the healing of Natalie Curtis. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. And we'll now hear from Joanna Davidson Politano. Joanna writes Gothic mysteries set in Victorian England, but works full-time as a puddle jumping, tree climbing adventure buddy with her three kids. 
After homeschooling and playtime, she immerses herself in historical England with all its shadowed corners and old family estates. She draws inspiration from Dickens' memorable characters and twisting plots, as well as Daphne du Maurier's atmospheric prose. She reads across several genres, especially suspense, historical romance, and mystery, and includes elements from all of these in her novels. Thanks to a honeymoon turned research trip to the UK, Joanna bases most of her novel settings on rambling old estates she has personally visited. Welcome, Joanna, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody, I'm Joanna, uh, and I absolutely love stories. Even though I have about 4,000 books at my house, I am all about libraries, so I'm really glad to be talking to you all today. Um, I actually have eight valid library cards, and I can't tell you how grateful I am to have a wealth of research and fun reading books, and also the librarians to help me sort through them. Um, some librarians may even know me by sight by now <laughs> because I'm there so often. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my books, uh, the inspiration for my latest one, some of the research and themes that might make it a good book for a discussion group. First, my books. I draw a lot of inspiration from master storyteller Charles Dickens and his twisting character-driven novels, uh, as well as some other classics authors. I combine some of my favorite story elements into my writing, and that includes mysteries, family secrets, and rambling old houses, a touch of gothic tones, and a bit of authentic heartfelt romance. I found that my novels appeal to a wide variety of readers because of this blend of all of my favorite genres. Um, I have five standalone titles published, and they all have the same combination of mystery and romance set in Victorian England. So my recent novel, A Midnight Dance, I invited readers into the Victorian Ballet Theater uh, for a little look at this vividly colorful corner of the world. Uh, I'm often asked why ballet and what inspired this story. So this book came about watching my little girl who is on the left there in that picture, fall madly in love with ballet. At four years old, she walked around the house on her tiptoes, springing into dance at random. I don't know if any of you have had a little girl like that. Uh, why walk from place to place, she seemed to say when dancing was an option. We've been through several years of ballet lessons with her at this point, and she and I have also attended about seven or eight professional performances. Um, and I have to admit, these live shows really swept me away. I was pretty much as hooked as my daughter. All the vibrancy and the color and the life of these shows, which you see reflected in her little face in the screen there, seeped into my heart as I wrote the book. And as I wonder how much of that shows up on the page, um, and thankfully, I was really excited when booklist reviewers sensed that same color and life in the novel uh, and the, the magic of ballet, as they put it. I love offering readers a glimpse of all that energy and life that is live theater and also my little girl's enthusiasm for ballet. So there are two women who also inspired me as I wrote this book, uh, who actually formed the basis for my heroine, and that is Audrey Hepburn and a long ago ballet dancer, Marie Taglioni. So these women were both known, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? These women were both known for their poise and simplicity uh, when that just wasn't common in their world. So uh, life in Hollywood was glamorous and showy in Audrey's time. She was the opposite, of course, and she stood out for it. And we all know her for those things. Also, Audrey secretly wanted to be a ballet dancer all her life, so I loved giving her a little bit of stage time through Ella, who's my heroine. Uh, Taglioni actually introduced a new ballet style. Taglioni is actually on the left in this picture here. Uh, and her new ballet style ended up reshaping the entire art Okay, can everybody hear me? All right, I think we lost internet for a little bit. Um, anyway, I apologize. So the European dancers of Taglioni's day focused on uh, kind of like acrobatic moves and shock factor and sensuality. And so then Marie came in with a simpler and more graceful ballet style, plain white gowns and flowers instead of jewels and pure talent rather than gimmicks and bright clothes. So I love the courage that she showed stepping out of what was expected and refusing to compromise for attention. So all of that went into my heroine. 
Uh, the plot evolved from Ella Blythe's character and her passion for ballet. In the opening scene, Craven Theater's principal dancer discovers Ella dancing alone in the attic during a performance. And together, they share a very atmospheric romantic midnight dance, which is the title, while the orchestra plays below. This principal, Philippe Rousseau, promises her after seeing her dance that one day they will be dancing together on the stage. And Ella just can't get that out of her mind. But when she returns to the theater years later as a fully trained dancer, Philippe does not recognize her. So she strives to both gain his attention through the book and also keep her place in the company. She does have one advantage over the other dancers, even though she's only had a couple years of training. Um, before her formal training, she learned ballet from a legendary former dancer, the ballerina no now known as the Ghost of Craven Street Theater. Something about this woman's tragic story doesn't add up though. And as Ella tries to uncover what really happened to this lost dancer, her own story kind of runs very eerily parallel to it, down to the unusual theater romance that she has with Philippe. So she only hopes that hers does not end up in tragedy as well. I spent almost a year just researching this novel and so much of what I learned about Victorian ballet really surprised me. My favorite part was that they actually pulled off a ghost effect even in the 1830s. And it was illusion with gaslights and mirrors which cast a dancer's reflection up onto the stage from down below where she danced. So they only saw the translucent reflection of her. So I've started compiling the most interesting parts of my research into short YouTube videos as a little bonus for readers or book clubs who wanna hear more about this story. This is just getting started. So there will be a lot more videos coming up for this book and other books. Um, and out of all this surprising research and the backstage drama of ballet, there also came some very rich themes that are great for discussion. This particular book asks questions about that nagging sense of not enough, which many of us in the art field especially struggle with. Uh, the idea of striving versus belonging, which when we feel we have to earn our place instead of creating and working from a place of already feeling be belonging and accepted. Uh, mundane repetition, does what I'm doing even matter? I have felt this one as a mother of three young kids and I felt it working in an office too. And then when I was writing this novel, I wondered if even that mattered in the long run, making up stories, which were mere entertainment. What good is that when there's so much hurt and need in the world? And along with that, we looked at the value of art and artists. And this comes about when the heroine's mother warns Ella that dancers are only remembered while they're on the stage. Their art is only valid while they are present. Then by age 35, their bodies are worn out and suddenly they don't matter. Um, a new generation is taking over and they're forgotten. I don't really set out to teach a series of moral lessons in my novels. Um, as author Ted Decker says, you write to discover, not to teach. And that's really what I do. So I start out with big questions that are rolling around in my own mind that don't necessarily have easy answers. And I see how the story unfolds and what it tells me about those questions I have. Um, people often ask me if I start out a story when I'm writing, knowing the story's ending and the answer to the theme questions. And the truth is, yes, I always know, but I'm always wrong. And the endings always surprise me. And honestly, surprise endings are my favorite books to read and to write. Um, I've discovered that readers who like my books also read authors such as Kate Morton, who has complex plots and family secrets that slowly unfold. <clears throat> Jamie Jo Wright, who writes immersive atmospheric mysteries with a strong themes and surprising twists. Uh, and Julie Klassen, who blends romance and intrigue in historical settings. Uh, my novels are uh, considered um, of the more, I, I don't know if I want to say clean, but uh, they do not have a lot of offensive material in them. Some of it is more adult material, um, <clears throat> but they're, they're good for a variety of readers. And I do enjoy meeting with book clubs as well. Um, so feel free to reach out to me and we can do a virtual thing if, you, if there's a book club that is choosing one of my books. So um, period dramas also like Downton Abbey and Poldark are uh, a lot of my readership as well, or people who enjoy those shows, I should say. So that's a little behind the scenes look at my ballet novel. I hope you enjoy the story if you do read it and that the ending surprises you as much as it surprised me. 
And thanks so much for listening in. Thank you so much, Joanna. Next up is Sydney Check. Sydney is a marketing coordinator at Penguin Random House. After graduating college with a degree in English, Sydney found her place with the library marketing department where she can share her love of books with others. When she isn't finding new ways to promote the latest titles, you can find her listening to podcasts, reading sappy love stories, and constantly comparing books to the movie remakes. Thank you for joining us, Sydney. Hi there. Thank you guys for having me. I'm so excited to chat about the latest and greatest um, book club books for you all today. Um, and let's get started. So you can, next slide, please. We're going to start off with Small World. Um, it's a sprawling chronicle of 170 years of American nation building from numerous points of view across place and time. The result is a historical epic with the Dickensian flair, a grand entertainment set against such iconic backgrounds as the California Gold Rush, the development of the Continental Railroad, and the speeding train of strangers who don't realize the history they have brought together in one place. Um, Jamie Ford, the New York Times bestselling author of The Hotel on the Corner of Bittersweet remarks, this is the kind of historical fiction that keeps you up all night burning in your veins like kerosene. So this is definitely a great book club book. Um, great for readers of My Sunshine Away by Emma Walsh and last by Andrew Sean Greer as well. Next. We have Joan is Okay by Waiki Wang. Um, this is a piercingly insightful new novel about a marvelously complicated woman who can't be anyone but herself from the award-winning author of Chemistry. Joan is a 30-something ICU doctor at a busy New York City hospital, the daughter of Chinese parents who came to the United States to secure the American dream for their children. Joan is an intensely devoted to her work, happily solitary and successful. She does look up sometimes and wonder where her true roots lie, at the hospital where her white coat makes her feel needed, or with her family who try to shape her life by their own cultural and social expectations. Deceptively spare yet quietly powerful, laced with sharp humor, Joan is Okay touches on matters that feel deeply resonant, being Chinese American right now, working in medicine at a high stakes time, finding one's voice within a dominant culture, being a woman in a male dominated workplace, and staying independent within a tight-knit family. But above all, it's a portrait of one remarkable woman so surprising that you can't get her out of your head. Next. First, there was Bridget Jones, then Eleanor Oliphant. Now, there is Yinka. In Yinka, Where Is Your Husband? Yinka's Nigerian aunties frequently pray for her delivery from singledom. Her work friends think she's too traditional. She's saving herself for marriage. Her girlfriends think she needs to get over her ex already, and the men in her life, well, that's a whole other story. But Yinka herself has always believed that true love will find her when the time is right. Still, when her cousin gets engaged, Yinka commences Operation Find a Date for Rachel's Wedding. Aided by a spreadsheet and her best friend, Yinka is determined to succeed. Will Yinka find herself a husband? And what if the thing she really needs to find is herself? Yinka Where's Your Husband brilliantly subverts the traditional romantic comedy with an unconventional heroine who bravely asks the questions we all have about love. A joyous, hilarious, hilarious wonderful heroine. Next. We have Black Cake by Charmaine Wilkerson, a moving debut novel about two estranged siblings who must set aside their differences to deal with their mother's death and her hidden past. In present day California, Eleanor Bennett's death leaves behind a puzzling inheritance for her two children, Byron and Betty. There's a traditional Caribbean black cake made from a family recipe with a long history and a voice recording. In her message, Eleanor shares a story about a headstrong young swimmer who escapes her island home under suspicion of murder. The secret she still holds back and the mystery of a long lost child challenge everything Byron and Benny thought they knew about their family and themselves. And this journey of discovery takes them from the Caribbean to London to California and ends with Eleanor's famous Black Cake. Black Cake is a powerful novel filled with unforgettable characters, incredible settings, inspired by the Black Cake recipe of the author's mother, and perfect for fans of Britt Bennett's The Vanishing Half, Yad Yassi's Homegoing, and for readers of Edgewidge, Danticat, and Jamaica Kincaid. Uh, next. 
Next, we all have another debut called The Violin Conspiracy, which is a riveting tale about a black classical musician and is perfect for readers of Jacqueline Woodson, Tiari Jones, as well as fans of the fast paced mysteries of Dan Brown. When aspiring musician Ray McMillan makes the startling discovery that his great grandfather's fiddle is actually a priceless Stradivarius, his star begins to rise. Then with the International Tchaikovsky Competition, the Olympics of classical music fast approaching, his prized family heirloom is stolen. And now his family and the descendants of the man who once enslaved Ray's great grandfather are each claiming that the violin belongs to them. When the odds stacked against him and the pressure mounting, will Ray ever see his beloved violin again? Slocum gives us a glimpse into the rarefied world of classical music, of multi-million dollar instruments, competitive world-class talent, and unsappable egos. In telling Ray's inspiring story of perseverance, the author draws on his own experiences as a professional violinist who faced discrimination. Next. Another debut, full of debuts as well, great for book clubs. This is a new, um, a new coming of age novel told from the perspective of 11 year old KB as she and her sister try over the course of a summer to make sense of their new life with their estranged grandfather after the death of their father and disappearance of their mother. Capturing all the vulnerability, perceptiveness and inquisitiveness of a young black girl on the cusp of puberty, Harris's prose perfectly inhabits that hazy space between childhood and adolescence, where everything that was once familiar develops a veneer of strangeness when seen through newer, older eyes. Through KB's disillusionment and subsequent discovery of her own power, What the Fireflies Knew poignantly reveals that heartbreaking but necessary component of growing up, the realization that loved ones can be flawed, sometimes significantly so, and that the perfect family we all dream of looks different up close. Next. In the vein of Mary Ellen Taylor's Honeysuckle Season, this amazing, breathtaking, and inspiring novel is full of hope and heart. When Kira first receives her breast cancer diagnosis, she never expects to end up joining a running group with three women she's only just met. Totally blindsided, all she can think about is how she doesn't want to tell her family or step back from work. Nor does she want to be part of a group of fellow cancer patients. Cancer is not her club. And yet it's running, hot, sweaty, lycra clad running in the company of brilliant, funny women all going through treatment that unexpectedly gives Kira the hope she so urgently needs because Kira will not be defined by the C word. And now with the Cancer Ladies Running Club cheering her on, she is going to reclaim everything, her family, her identity and her life. Josie Lloyd's fearless novel is a tribute to the power of the human spirit in the face of hardship based on the author's own experience with cancer and community. Next. Next, we have The Verifiers by Jane Peck. This is perfect for fans of amateur sleuths with bright, brilliant voices, and for anyone looking for the classic pleasures of a detective romp, but from a queer, racially diverse perspective. Claudia Lynn is used to disregarding her fractious family's model minority expectations. She has no interest in finding either a conventional career or a nice Chinese boy. She's also used to keeping secrets from them such as that she prefers girls and that she's just been stealth recruited by Veracity, a referrals only online dating detective agency. A lifelong mystery reader who wrote her senior thesis on Jane Austen, Claudia believes she's landed her ideal job. But when a client goes missing, Claudia breaks protocol to investigate and uncovers a maelstrom of personal and corporate deceit. Dun, dun, dun. Next. Um, we have The Unsinkable Greta James by Jennifer E. Smith, who is the author of nine books for young adults, including The Statistical Probability of Love at First Sight and Hello, Goodbye, and Everything in Between. Um, the Unsinkable Greta, Unsinkable Greta James will be Jennifer E. Smith's breakout adult debut, and we are so excited for this. Um, an indie musician reeling from tragedy and in a public breakdown reconnects with her estranged father on a week-long cruise in this pitch-perfect story about the ways we recover love in the strangest places. This read is perfect for fans of Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid and Abby Drake Starts Over by Linda Holmes. Um, Jennifer E. Smith's light-handed approach to wrestling with life's big questions would make this a perfect book club pick. Next. And our last pick um, for the day is Don't Know Tough by Eli Cranor. Um, this is Friday Night Lights meets Southern Gothic with a thrilling debut for readers of Megan Abbott and Wiley Cash. 
Trent Powers relocates his family from Anaheim to Arkansas to take over as head coach of the Denton Pirates, a high school football team powered by a volatile but talented running back named Billy Lowe. Billy comes from an extremely troubled home, a trailer park, where he's terrorized by his unstable mother's abusive boyfriend. Billy takes out his anger on the field, and it's not long before he crosses a line. Instead of punishing him, though, Trent takes Billy into his home, hoping to protect his star player as the Pirates begin their playoff run. But when Billy's abuser is found murdered, nothing can stop an explosive chain of violence that could tear their own town apart. This book will provide much to talk about for book clubs that love a good small town thriller. And it was also the winner of the Peter Lovesey First Crime Novel Contest. Uh, next. So based after, if you're still looking for more book club resources, we have a plethora of information that we have to offer. On our issue page, we have book club brochures, which we put together seasonally, uh, with that include discussion guides as well. We have book club kits that are more title-based, and we also have Spanish language book club kits. So if you follow our link on the slide, um, you can have tons of access. You can download them, print them at your own leisure. They're a great resource for book clubs. Uh, next. And we also can't forget about audio. So we have a fabulous array of book club listens on audio on our website, Books on Tape. Um, we recently just did a post about celebrity book club clicks and audio from Oprah to Jenna to Reese to Good Morning America. There's everything you need there. So definitely a great resource to check out as well. Next. And before I go, we have a few upcoming events I'd like to highlight, our morning book buzz, our library lunch and learn, and our winter book and author festival. Um, and you can register for those events with the tiny URLs below as well. And we're really excited for all three of those and more information to come. Uh, next. Thank you again for having me. I really appreciated this time to chat with you about the Winter Book Club books. We've created an Edelweiss collection where you can request e-galleys um, on Edelweiss for all of these titles. So if you follow this tiny URL, you can find those and request away. And we'll be sure to make sure that we have these titles available for you. So thanks again and um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Sydney. Our next panelist today is Lainey Mays. Lainey is the marketing associate of the library marketing team at HarperCollins. Originally from Mississippi, her hobbies include listening to any podcast she can find and she produces the Library Love Fest podcast, a podcast that brings librarians and great books together through author interviews, conversations with editors, and upcoming book presentations. Take it away, Lainey. Thank you. So good to be here. Uh, happy fall, y'all. It's uh, in the air here in New York City. Um, so on the next slide, that's an email if anybody needs me on the next slide. Um, we just wanted to quickly tell you about our social, so Library Love Fest. As you can see, we have lots of resources. So check us out on all of our socials. We have a book club catalog online. We have all of our book club resources. So it's perfect for you. Next is, oh, yep. So I'll one-stop shopping. So you can find it all there. And our podcast that she just mentioned is, there's a link there as well. Next slide. We do author events. So book clubs, authors need to come to book clubs. Let us know. And that's on our website as well. So you don't have to scribble away. You can go check out all the steps there. Next. And we do door to door, which is a great way to get some kind of supplemental information. So for your book club, if you're gonna sit down and discuss a book, um, you can also hear from the author themselves. So you could also play this at book clubs, but join us today, um, right after this for a special door to door time. And you can see all of our archives. Next uh, podcast. Uh, we do a really cool thing where we talk to our library reads winners. So get excited for that upcoming one next. Okay, let's not bury any leads here. I know you're very excited about The Diamond Eye by Kate Quinn. This is a beloved Kate Quinn. She wrote The Rose Code and Alice Network. Uh, everyone loves her. Now she's back with the fur for the first time in hardcover. So very exciting. Um, this is the unexplored true World War II history um, book about a librarian. What more could you ask for? And it's about a Ryan Bookish history student, Mila, who organizes her life around her library job and her young son. And then when Hitler invades Russia, she forges this different path away from that. And she has to decide what her life's gonna be like. So she's sent to join the fight and becomes a lethal hunter of Nazis known as Lady Death. And when news of her 300th kill makes her, makes her a national heroine, she is uh, sent on kind of a goodwill tour 
So she arrives in Washington, D.C., kind of to a glitzy D.C., and she's still battling a lot of um, loneliness and isolation that she feels from coming from this war. And she strikes up kind of an unlikely friendship with First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt and even a more unexpected relationship with a fellow uh, sniper. And then an old enemy from her past comes and is lurking in the shadows. So, you know, there's also a lot of uh, fun and intrigue in Kate's work. And it's based on a true story, which Kate does so well, taking women in history. And she has great subplots that all just come together wonderfully and just show like badass women and their contributions to history. So next we have Beautiful Little Fools by Jillian Cantor. So any great Gatsby fans? Okay, even if you are a fan, you're gonna love this, but even if you're not, you might, because even if you reread great, The Great Gatsby, it's a classic, but you might find yourself wondering, what do the women think? <laughs> There's not a lot from their side. And Jillian Cantor felt the same way. So she wanted to go back and look at this uh, story from three women in the book and tell it from their alternating perspectives. So uh, that's where the title comes from. If you're a fan, you know what part of the book that comes from. And it starts on the last day of the first book in August, 1922. We have Jay Gatsby who's dead. Seems pretty cut and dry, but then um, the police find a gold, uh, sorry, not a gold, a diamond hairpin in the bushes. Maybe they're thinking that, uh, they don't really know the whole story. Why is the hairpin there? It must belong to one of the women. So then you kind of go back and forth between that time and you get to hear from Daisy Buchanan. Um, she thought she was gonna marry Gatsby at one time, but she had a family tragedy that kind of pushed her in the arms of Tom Buchanan. And you have Jordan Baker, her best friend who has a secret from when she was on the trail of a bit, she was a famous golfer. Then you have Catherine McCoy, who's Myrtle Wilson's sister. She's a suffragette. And so it's really fun to revisit all of these and like hear about um, another history making 20s um, and why they got there. And I think uh, Jillian's Behind the Book really discussed that a lot, which was interesting of like, what is it like for them and what brought them to this place? And there's a lot of love coming on. Jillian's gonna be on door to door on October 19th. So I hope you can come here from her. Next is Angels of the Pacific by Elise Hooper. So Elise is back with another wonderful historical fiction. I'm reading this right now and I'm gulping it down. I'm so immersed. It's so fun. Um, but it's inspired by the Angels of Bataan, uh, World War II American Army nurses. They were held as prisoners during the occupation of the Philippines in World War II. Um, and then the unsung contributions of the Filipinas of the resistance, as well as the civilians who lived through the occupation of the nation by Japan. So like I said, set in the Philippines, 1941, you have several two characters really that you follow. We have Tess Abbott, who's this American army nurse, had a hard time during the, the Great Depression. And so she's kind of escaping that for this glam posting where not much happens in uh, Manila. And then you have um, Floor, who's a Filipino university student, and she's kind of drawn into this underground network of resistance when the Japanese Imperial Army invade. So Tess takes her band of nurses on the front lines as well as floors there too. And they are trying to get around, you know, thrust into battle and li they live through years of incarceration. They're captured as prisoners, held through the high stone walls of Manila's Santa Tomas internment camp, and they're stranded. They don't think that there's any rescue. And um, it's just a fascinating story because it's true. And Elise really wanted to explore this band of strong women and kind of why this, why you can hold out hope when hope seems lost, which I think we all kind of can understand in these days. And so writing it during the pandemic, I think really uh, propelled that thought in underneath too. And she really transports you. And again, we love hearing women's stories in history, but this one is kind of in a place, World War II books, historical fiction don't really go to the Philippines. So something new, something new to learn. Next is Woman on Fire, Woman on Fire, sorry, by Lisa Barr. It's a new historical novel from the author of The Fugitive Colors and The Unbreakables. Art and espionage, we're here, sign us up. Um, this story is, uh, the story for this novel comes from the very real fact that leading up to the, the decade leading up to 1945, um, it's estimated that the Nazis stole one fifth of all the artworks in Europe, upwards of 650,000 paintings, sculptures, drawings, et cetera. And in this book, Jules Roth is a, so that's the real story. And then in this book, we have Jules Roth, who's a young journalist. She's giving an given an unusual and very secret assignment. She's working for 
the lead investigative reporter in Chicago, Dan, and he needs her to locate a painting that was stolen by the Nazis more than 75 years earlier. And uh, it's for legendary expressionist artist Ernst Engel. And uh, I'm sorry, it's for the legendary expressive expressionist artist Ernst Engel's Woman on Fire. Um, Ellis Baum is a famous shoe designer and he wants it for a personal collection. And um, yeah, so she has to try to go on the hunt and there is not much time because he unfortunately is dying. So she, he's trying to find this painting before. And so um, meanwhile in Europe, there's a cunning gallerist, uh, Margot, who is searching for the painting. She's the heir to her art collector family's millions. And they're both kind of on the hunt for this and using all the resources they can. So it's really thrilling of like, how, who can find it first? And Kristen Armel said, part thriller, part World War II epic. Woman in gold meets spotlight, meets basic instinct in an extraordinary novel, which is certain to be snapped up by Hollywood just as surely as it will be devoured in one sitting by captivated readers who turn the pages quickly enough. Um, very excited. You'll see this all over social, I think. So you're, you'll hear about this book. Next is How High We Go in the Dark by Sequoia Nagamatsu. This is we're so excited for this one. I personally am. It was the top 10 of fall 2021 by Publishers Weekly, um, sci-fi fantasy uh, horror genre. Um, and so it's a lyrical novel. It features a collection of stories about a near future where people are experiencing or have experienced a world altering plague. And the people in these stories sometimes intersect. They travel through time and space to show how we cope with loss and find a new place to call home or find love when it seems impossible to love again. It begins in 2030, um, a ancient crater is unveiled and a plague melts to the permafrost. Then it goes centuries after and just what it means for humanity. And it's got some really wacky stories and it's super interesting and you don't have to read them all in order, but really they all kind of intersect with one another. And uh, an amazing review from the sci-fi magazine Lightspeed uh, last week came out and it called it, there's a car outside, I'm sorry. A book that is innately, essentially human in a way few writers manage to capture. There's so much love. Think plain bad heroines. If you have readers of that, they're going to want this book. It's so speculative and different, and I've never read anything like it, but it will bring a tear to your eye. It's dark, but it's not a plague book. You know, I was a little hesitant, and it's not a plague. He wrote this for like 10 years, so don't think that it's that. It's really, really beautiful, and it, at the end, it's about those people and their ability to love and go through loss. Next is Black Girls Must Be Magic. So this is the second installment in Black Girls Must Die Exhausted, that series. The first one came out this past month, September. Um, it's a book that was originally self-published and we republished it. And then the love for her just kept coming and she uh, calls it an epitaph of my thirties. So, and she also said she wants her books to rival any housewives that you could ever watch. So if that tells you anything, um, and in that book, the main character was told she might not ever have biological children. And so she kind of came to terms with that. And this one, there's a baby on the way. And she's got to make a lot of uh, decisions that affect her baby's future. And uh, she really leans on these women that she's created for herself. So there's so much. A New York Times book review just gave an amazing review for the first book in this series, Black Girls Must Die Exhausted. So the second one is a really great follow up. And that cover is beautiful. Um, and yeah, it's always, it's highly readable. Women's fiction that really has something deep down, but it really deals with contemporary women's issues and sorry, transcultural and multidimensional characters. Next is The Good Wife of Bath by Karen Brooks. So another wonderful immersive historical fiction from Karen Brooks. This is, uh, it's, it's the, re you know, back to beautiful little fools concept of telling women's stories in history. And so this is Chaucer's Wife of Bath, but from her point of view. So England, 1364, a woman gets married off really young at 12 to a really elderly farmer and quickly realizes that no matter what she says or does, it doesn't matter. And she kind of builds her way to um, through this marriage. It, it was OK, but she keeps getting married and there's a lot of murder and mayhem and fun things. But on the journey, she's just trying to find what most women want. And that's your voice and who controls their own life. Uh, for your English major nerds, you're going to enjoy meeting Chaucer, who it's a big part of the book, and uh, there's a really cool reader's group guide in this as well. Oh, and there was one in uh, Angels of the Pacific as well, I did not mention. Next is the Mayfair Bookshop, Eliza Knight. So USA Today bestselling author Eliza Knight weaves a modern story about a young American who travels to London to work at the famous Haywood Hill Bookshop with 
And then the, that's part of the story. And the other part is in the past with pre-World War II life of novelist Nancy Mitford and her five sisters. Nancy was one of London's bright young things and she was a journalist and a bookseller and she was really an active supporter of the Allies and worked as an aid worker in France and at home. So it goes between 1938 and present day and the lives of these two women, they find that they are intertwined and um, perfect for fans of historical fiction like The Last Bookshop in London, or if you've watched the recent TV series, Pursuit of Love, all for you, books about books, that's always a crowd favorite. So now, and last is The Girls of Flight City by Lorraine Heath. So you might know Lorraine's name. She is the romance novelist, but this is a new genre for her. So we're very, very excited. And if you're fans of her, you'll love this. If not, a lot of new fans will come over. There's always a little romance in there as well. And it takes place in 1941 um, at a flight school in Texas that the British pilots were there to train. So you see three women as they go about trying to either get their dream of becoming an instructor or someone who wants to do the flight simulator. And so it's all about these women and their role in to prepare all of these young cadets to take to the skies and defeat the dangers that await. Uh, Lorraine was inspired by her own family connection to write this story. Her father went to school in Terrell, Texas, where one of the flight schools was based. And it was the inspiration for the setting of the story, as well as her mother's childhood as a girl outside of London during the Blitz. It has a PS section and a reading guide, so great for book clubs as well. All right. I think I gave you a lot, but if I have more time, which clearly I don't because I could talk about it all day, these are some more books. They're really wonderful. And then next, that's, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Lainey. Our final panelist today will be Emily Ludloff. Emily is a library marketing associate at Sourcebooks. Previously, she worked with some of the top names in the music industry in Nashville, Tennessee, but ultimately could not res resist the pull of her first love books. Bring us home, Emily. Hello, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Emily Ludloff, and I am a library marketing associate at Sourcebooks. Thank you to Booklist for hosting this winter book club picks webinar. I hope I have a bunch of great books for you to read. Um, and all of these titles are available on NetGalley and Edelweiss. Uh, and feel free to reach out if you have any questions about our new titles, resources, or virtual author visits. Um, as you see on this uh, slide, we have authors all over the world who are available to speak virtually at your library, school, or book club, um, please contact our event specialist, Ashlyn, for more information on how you can get these authors at your book club. Next. Additionally, we have a book club brochure. Um, each book featured in, in this free online guide includes a description of the book, food and beverage recommendations, so you know what to bring to your book club meeting, and what I like to call a vibe guide um, to figure out if the book will be a good fit for your book club. So you can download that online here at this link, or you can send me an email and I will send you a copy. Next slide, please. We are going to start the day off with our Poison Pen Press imprint, which is mystery. All right, next, please. All right, so the Department of Rare Books and Special Collections. This is a book by, oh, one back, please. Slide, there, uh, there we go, that slide, perfect. Okay, so this is a book by Eva Yurchek, and it asks, what holds more secrets in the library? Is it the ancient books stacked on the shelves or the people who preserve them? So in this book, when Liesl Weiss's boss has a stroke, she's left to run things. And she discovers that the library's most prized manuscript is missing. Liesl tries to sound the alarm and inform the police about the missing priceless book, but is repeatedly told to keep quiet to keep the doors open and to keep the donors happy. What Liesl discovers about the dusty manuscripts as she worked, that she has worked among for so long 
and about the people who care about for them shakes the very foundation on which she has built her life. Next slide, please. In The Woman in the Library, Hannah receives a fan letter. Oh, yep, there we go. <laughs> receives a fan letter from a distant friend asking after her newest mystery. Delighted by the inquiry, she responds with a few pages about a novel she's working on about four strangers who become inseparable after a murder is discovered at their library. Thrilled and intrigued, Leo writes back with some helpful advice. The four friends Hannah created will have to help her create a world to, that absorbs Leo's increasingly insistent dark attention. This is a clever puzzle within a puzzle about an author who is trying to write her own fate without losing control of the story. I've had multiple friends at Sourcebooks read this this past weekend and have come to me screaming about the ending and about how it's twisty and how great the writing is. And I just know that this book is gonna be your next obsessive read. Next slide, please. Okay, and now on to Sourcebooks Landmark and some fiction titles. Next, please. So True Crime Story by Joseph Knox. It is a strikingly original novel that twists transcripts, emails, and documents together into an investigation of a missing college girl. While it also weaves in the mystery of how the narrator and author, Joseph Knox, came to be in possession of these files and what fate befell the original author, as well as why Knox may not be telling us everything he knows. True Crime Story is an ambitious, sharp exploration of our obsession with all things true crime from a former crime bookseller. This one is also super twisty and awesome. And you can see it got a star review recently and it's just everyone's talking about it. Next slide, please. Her Head and Genius is the next novel from the New York Times bestselling powerhouse, Marie Benedict. We always love Marie Benedict stories. This time Her Hidden Genius shines a light on Rosalind Franklin, who is the woman who died to make a world changing scientific discovery about our very DNA. It's about a woman whose thinking was suppressed by the men around her, but whose relentless drive gave us profound knowledge of humankind. Next slide, please. All right, now Must Love Books by Shauna Robinson. Nora's life is spiraling and the publisher she works for is sinking. So when they decide to cut her salary, Nora decides to moonlight for a rival publisher. But when Andrew Santos, a best-selling author from her publisher, is thrown into the mix, Nora has to decide where her loyalties lie. Is it with her new dream job, ever optimistic Andrew, or herself and her future? Next slide, please. In the next ship home, Two women bound together to hold America to its promise of a better life. But Ellis Island isn't a refuge for either of them. Not when ships depart every day with those who are refused entry to the country and when corruption ripples through every corridor. As the two women face the misdeeds of a system known to manipulate and abuse immigrants, they form an unlikely friendship and share a terrible secret that authors their fates and the lives of the immigrants who come after them. Next, please. All right, so now we're going to dig into some of our new nonfiction titles. Next, please. First is The Secrets of Sprakar. So Canadian born writer, Eliza Reed never expected to live in Iceland at all, much less become its first lady. But after meeting her Icelandic husband at university, Eliza's life transformed when he won the presidency. Her new position granted her remarkable insight into the roles of Icelandic women in business, 
politics, the home, and more. Eliza's immigrant perspective offers an uplifting examination of Iceland's reputation of being one of the best places in the world to be a woman. Next, please. In How Do I Unremember This, host of the hit podcast, Everything Iconic, Danny Pellegrino shares a collection of his most humorous and heartfelt real life stories about growing up as a closeted gay kid in Ohio. How Do I Unremember This is an unfiltered and all too relatable glimpse into Danny's life and the heartfelt and hilarious moments that shaped it. Although he wouldn't change any of them for the world, these stories are unfortunately true. Next slide, please. In the Pursuit of Jefferson is a surprising story of one man's attempt to follow an obscure travel guide through Europe written by Thomas Jefferson during the darkest time of the complex founding father's life. But as the author follows Jefferson's travel guide, what he learns isn't always what Jefferson had in mind. And he, as he comes to understand Thomas Jefferson better, he doesn't always like what he finds. Next slide, please. I'm going to pun for you now. Watch your book club bloom as you try some of these romantic titles. I hope you enjoyed that. Next slide, please. All right. King of Battle and Blood is the first in a new epic fantasy series by best-selling beloved author Scarlett St. Clair. In order to end a years-long war between vampires and mortals, Isolde must wed vampire king Adrian and then assassinate him. <laughs> but surviving the vampire court doesn't prove to be nearly as difficult as is resisting the intense attraction between her and Adrian. And I will say, I started this book last night and I stayed up way too late reading. I'm spending my day anxiously waiting till I can pick it up again. I am enthralled. And next slide, please. And of course, we'll always have Casablanca for some great more romance reads. <laughs> Next slide, please. So we are heading back to Olympus in the second book in Katie Roberts' Dark Olympus series, Electric Idol. In this book, Eros is commanded by his mother to bring her psyche's heart on a platter, literally. Eros does the only thing he can think of to save Psyche's life. He marries her. As lines blur and loyalties shift, Psyche realizes Eros might take her heart after all. And she's not sure if she can survive that loss. And this is a book I read over a month ago and I haven't been able to get out of my mind. So good luck trying to get it out of yours. <laughs> all right, next slide, please. All right, in the family she never met, Jessica Russo knows nothing about her mother's family or her Cuban culture. But when the Cuban grandmother she's never met offers Jessica the chance to come to Miami and meet her estranged family, she can't help but say yes, even as she knows that it'll pain her mother. As Jessica spends her time with her grandmother on a beautiful island estate, she learns about her family's history and what caused the schism between her mother and grandmother. She soon decides that she is going to fix her fracture family. Next slide, please. And that is all I have for you. Thank you all so, so much for listening. And thank you again to Booklist for letting me share some upcoming winter book club titles from Sourcebooks. Please reach out to me if at my email if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Oh, and we have a question. Okay. Uh, King of Bile and Blood will be an audiobook. Yes. All right. Thank you guys so, so much. Have a wonderful day.
Thank you so much, Emily, and a big thank you to all of today's wonderful panelists. Tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's slide presentation, title list, certificate of completion, and video recording. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit booklistonline.com webinars, where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones like the ones you see here. Not yet a subscriber? Pair the print reading experience with the convenience of online access at booklistonline.com and lock in print, online, digital, and archive access by taking advantage of the special webinar offer to get Booklist for only $75. Patron-friendly, librarian-approved, and free with a Booklist subscription, Booklist Reader, Booklist's new digital-only magazine highlighting diverse readers' advisory recommendations for all ages has arrived. To see and share the latest issue, which is currently freely available to all, visit booklistonline.com slash reader hyphen issues. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. One more huge thank you to our panelists and our sponsors, Penguin Random House Library Marketing, Sourcebooks, HarperCollins Publishers, and Ravel. See you next time.